Good morning. I'm Dr. Marianne Cintron, founder of Step-by-Step -Step Dyslexia Solutions. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our mission is to help children develop literacy skills so they can realize their full potentials and positively give back to their communities. And the way we do this is by training teachers and parents and paraprofessionals and we, we are trying to raise scholarships to help those who can't afford the training, and we write grants to do that. So I welcome you here. I have been an educator for 20 years and a classroom teacher for 10, and I am passionate about helping children read by fourth grade, because if they're not reading by fourth grade, they're at risk of dropping out of high school and going to prison. So I'm gonna ask you to not chat right now, if you would, uh, put your comments and your questions in on a piece of paper and I'm going to leave some time at the end of the webinar and answer all your questions but I'm going to go ahead and start the meeting right now and share my PowerPoint and I want to go to the large screen So I don't see myself and you probably don't see me either. And I don't know why, um, but anyway. <laughs> so um, this is day one of a two day webinar. And I wanna ask you, how would your life be different? Oh, hold on a second. Oh, um, let me do something. Sorry about that. I need to share my screen. I wasn't seeing that prompt. Okay. Okie doke. Good, now I can see the picture. I have my co-host giving me some prompts that we couldn't see it. Okay, so, how would your life be different if you couldn't read? Just think about that. So many people struggle with reading. One in five people has dyslexia, have dyslexia. So I'm gonna share it this way. These are my credentials. But I want to share with you that I didn't learn about dyslexia until much later um, after being a teacher. I um, started my, in, in, the, in the late 1990s, I was a room mom in my children's classrooms for kinder and first grade. And I started noticing how their teachers so strategically taught reading, writing, spelling, and it really got my attention because I felt that if these teachers weren't properly trained, they could really set these children on a wrong trajectory. So it really inspired me to go to school and get my credential and my master's. My daughter actually wanted me to homeschool her and I really felt that, I, that God was calling me to have a greater reach to a lot of kids who were struggling. So after I got my credential, I worked in the public schools for two years and I started seeing the children who were bright and intelligent, but they just couldn't read or write. And I was teaching a second language learner class and children would stay after school and talk with me, but they couldn't write, but they were really interesting and intelligent. And someone told me, why don't you go back to school and get a special ed credential? So I did, and it wasn't until my master's program that a professor recommended I join the International Dyslexia Association of which I'm now a member of the Tri-County branch. And that's where I learned about dyslexia. And I learned it wasn't just a reversal of letters, but it was much, much more. <clears throat> I started reading about Sam Orton and Anna Gillingham and who they were, the, you know, the pioneers of helping children who were struggling with reading. And I also learned the value of using music with reading. So I worked in a private school and I was asked to teach a summer school program for six weeks. And I used the music with the phonics-based reading program. There was a parent from an outside district 
who was ready to sue her district because her son was going to enter sixth grade and he was reading at a low third grade level and she was really angry. So he was in our program for the six weeks and he made three years gains in reading fluency, vocabulary and comprehension. And she was ecstatic and she didn't have to sue her district. She actually worked for the district. So it was very scary for her. And he, she reported that he's in middle school and he's in special ed, he was in RSP, but he was being successful and he was progressing. So that's just a wonderful story. It really inspired me to have my own private business so I would have a greater reach. So I had a program with the state of California and I worked with low income school districts, <clears throat> five of them, excuse me. And I trained college kids and people who were substitute teachers that weren't working to work with at-risk students. There was a student in one district, she was an eighth grader, Hispanic gal, and just a beautiful gal being raised by her grandfather because her mom was in prison. And he was so concerned that she was gonna follow her mom's um, pattern and go into prison. So he said nothing they ever tried after school had ever worked for her. And he wanted to try our program because the music intrigued him. So after two weeks, he started noting, noticing a big difference in her self-esteem and her enjoyment of going to school. She wasn't making excuses to not go. And she was starting to get along with people. So after six weeks, now I've had middle schoolers and I know those hormones are pretty crazy in middle school. So this is a huge testimony. At the end of six weeks, she had made three years gains also in reading fluency, comprehension, and vocabulary. And he said, this is a miracle. What are you doing? And I said, I'm using music. It's the missing link with phonics. And he said, you know, our home used to be a battlefield. She gets along with us now. Um, she enjoys going to school. She's doing her homework. She gets along with her peers. You know, I wrote about her in my book, A Message of Hope. I wrote about Danielle in chapter seven because it was huge. And he said, this is a miracle. Are you a doctor? And that prompted me to get my doctorate. I felt God was calling me now to get another degree, but it was so important to let people know about music. And when I tried privately, people just didn't want to listen. So let me get some research behind it and people are going to really listen. It took me seven years to get my doctorate. And I wrote about it in this book. And I was asked to teach middle school and high school in Los Angeles. So they had me teaching math. There was a great need and that's where I met the need. So while math became my second love, I was still passionate to teach reading. And after working four and a half, four and a half years in the public schools, I needed to leave. And I traveled the, world, traveled the nation with another organization who taught teachers how to work with dyslexic students. But after a year, I had to just start my own private practice. So I started the nonprofit. My husband was prompted one morning, last January at 4.30 in the morning, to get up, get up and build the music app. And we knew what that meant, but he resisted getting up and he heard it again in, in his spirit, build the music app. And when he told me about it that day, we knew we had to do something and get the musical, the music digital. And so what we did was developed an app called Dunking Dyslexia, plays music in the left ear and spelling exercises in the right ear. And I needed a reading program to go with this, so I developed my own reading program called Step-by-Step -Step Reading. And that's how I equip heroic teachers with an effective literacy program to remediate dyslexia so we can close the achievement gap, stop the school-to-prison pipeline, and prepare kids for success in school and in life. This is a picture of my family. My daughter just got married in November, and there she is with my handsome sons. And there, uh, here is my son-in-law with his young boy. And we are a blended family, so I remember well what it was like to want to honor your stepson. Here's my daughter, my, my husband and I. We've been married 30 years, and uh, we're just, he's a wonderful husband. So these are the learning outcomes 
that encouraged you to be here today. I'm so glad you're here from all over the world. We have people from UK and all over. So welcome. Um, you're going to learn how to describe dyslexia to others. You'll understand what dyslexia feels like and the adverse impact it has on dyslexic students. So I hope you have a pad of paper. And if you don't, please run and get one because I'm going to be giving you some simulations today. You'll be able to recognize dyslexia in the classroom. You'll be able to understand the ways to teach phonological awareness. And you're going to learn about the Orton Gillingham model for teaching dyslexic students how to read. And, and you're going to be able to demonstrate your understanding of the benefits of being structured and systematic. So I want to ask you, how would you add these numbers up? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to look at this number line. And once you've added it, I want you to raise your hand and let me know if you got an answer. Okay, thank you. Melissa and Neely have their hands raised. Well, some of you, what I, let me show, tell you what I did. I put a zero, I had an imaginary zero here. So then I counted by tens. So I counted 10, 20, 30, 40, 55. My math, that's the way my brain sees math and that's how I did it. But I learned that people did it so many other ways I wouldn't even have imagined. Some people actually added one to two, and then added three, and then added four, and then added five. Some people counted by 11s. 11, 22, 33, 44, 55. So there's different ways to add, and some people even added this way. And the reason I show that is to let you see there's different ways to teach, there's different ways to learn, some ways seem to be more fast, faster and more effective than others, but when you know strategies to teach students to read, especially if they're dyslexic, it can be very effective. Sometimes we're surprised by those strategies. This is a sample of a pre-test that I give a student asking him to write some sentences. I'm going to read them for you and just see the, the challenges he had. The clam sat on the bottom of the ocean. They rushed into the cottage in the nick of time. We gathered around the campfire and told ghost stories. Pittsfield has a population of about 50,000. A conference was held to determine the, a certain course of action. I, love, I would love to share this mound of donuts with my cousin and you. This is the typical writing of a dyslexic student. There's no punctuation. This little guy capitalized, but not here and not here. There's missing syllables. There's missing words. Often these children will glance and guess at words. So if they haven't memorized the words, you know, on and the, this little guy memorized the words. But if they're unfamiliar words, they struggle with sounding them out because they haven't developed that phonemic awareness. So writing is very difficult for them. I've had to have students read me what they wrote because I couldn't even read it. This is an example of uh, dyslexia in the workplace. There was a gal who was assigned to the cash register who couldn't read or write. And she knew it. And she told me because I made one little correction. I said, oh, guest is, do you mind if I share with you how to spell guest? No, that's okay. So I said, it's G-U-E-S-T. So she got it correct here, but she, I didn't correct anything else. She spelled dollars wrong, dining room wrong. 
She rhymed Dale with pale. This was a receipt at a nursing home when I went to have lunch with an elderly friend down in San Diego. So I was with her, the elderly lady's husband. So you could see in the workplace, it's very embarrassing. I heard of a gentleman say that when he even tried to fill out a job application, he felt like a liar because he had to have a friend fill out his job application. And when he finally learned to start reading using music, it opened up a whole world of confidence to him. And that's what we're gonna see with what happens for children who start reading, building their confidence. So the formal definition of dyslexia is that it's a very specific learning disability. It's neurobiological in origin. It's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. But I have an easy way to describe it, that it's neurological in origin and the brain can be retrained. We've retrained our brain for so many other things. If you think about how you eat, how you exercise, how you think of people differently, how you think of life differently. And it's really a learning difference, not a disability. And it affects students reading, writing, and speaking. So it's neurological in origin, the brain can be retrained. It's a learning difference, not a disability. And it affects re the students reading, writing, and speaking. This is Cruz. We worked with him last year. He didn't know his letter names and sounds in March of last year, and he was going into second grade. He was a homeschooled student, and his mom was very concerned because the homeschool was giving him speech, and she recognized he needed help at age four and five, but they weren't diagnosing him as dyslexic. So he did get a diagnosis as dyslexic. I assessed him and gave the, um, the data. And so he worked with letter names and sounds from March until July. And then I trained the tutor to work with my reading program in July with him. So from July to this March, he actually exited special ed for reading. And um, he enjoys reading. And he just got this uh, assessment done from the school. And they said he's reading at a fourth grade level. This is a, a little second grader who didn't even know his letter names and sounds a year ago, a little over a year ago. So I'll tell you, the music with phonics has a profound impact. And I just recently assessed him myself. And it was funny because I pulled out the phonological awareness drill. It's called the C-top. And he just blew right through it. You know, we were substituting letter sounds. He was deleting sounds and syllables and... He knew his letter names and sounds beautifully. He's like, this is boring. So that he is just like our poster child. He had a kindergarten sister and he thought she was smarter than him. And now that he can read, he's teaching her the grammar rules on his own whiteboard at home. And his mother said, I never would have dreamt he would be at this place. And she said, it's miraculous. It's a miraculous difference. It's changed his life, is her testimony. So now I'm gonna get, well, let me give a, see a raised hands if, if you're just so proud of Cruz and so proud of his tutor for helping him. It takes someone that's passionate to wanna to see students succeed. And, and the tutor just really saw his progress and was just so proud of him. Yay, thanks for raising your hands. Okay, so now this is your first dyslexia simulation. You should have a piece of paper by you right now. What I want you to do with this paragraph, I want you to remove every second vowel in the word, if there is one, and rewrite that word. Okay, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to do that. Okay, raise your hand again if you're finished, if you tried it. I wanna be sure you try it. 
because it's really going to do something in your brain. Okay, good. I want to get you really engaged in this webinar. I know it's a temptation to multitask when you're on a webinar, but getting engaged is really going to be important. Okay, so I think there's about 14 words. Did I count correctly? So let me ask you, was this pretty challenging to do that? Yes. So now if you used highlighters, what if you used a pink highlighter and every word that had two letters, you would highlight? And then with a pencil, just remove that second letter and then rewrite the word. That's an example how about the visual um, component of learning. We want to teach kids with a multi-sensory learning style where it's auditory, visual, and it's hands-on. So the more colors you can introduce or the more activities where it's hands-on, they're going to learn better. So myth or fact? I want you to raise your hand if it's a fact and don't raise your hand if it's a myth. Fourth graders in Los Angeles are reading better than the national average. No one's raising their hands and that is because it's a myth. California fourth graders are testing far below the average reading, uh, the national reading average. Los Angeles students are among the lowest in California. 66% of the students fail to reach grade level reading and they rarely catch up. I have a professor friend who teaches criminal justice at one of the local universities and he told me when he worked for the Department of Justice back east, there was a state that looked at the illiteracy rate of third graders to determine how many prisons to build. Now imagine if we could teach these students how to read at a young age, build their self-esteem, keep them out of special ed, keep them out of prison, and what a better use of our taxpayer dollars. Danny Trejo is one guy that turned his life around. I'm still waiting to see. He was in prison and I'm wondering if he was dyslexic, but I'm gonna share with you um, some data and I'm gonna use the acronym COPS because a lot of the kids end up in prison so the C stands for the reading crisis that we have in our nation. The National Association of Educational Progress gives us a report card every year. They look at the scores of fourth graders and eighth graders to see how we're doing as a nation. So nationwide, there was a mandate to assess for dyslexia and provide intervention by the 2017-18 school year. That was signed in California on October 15th, 2015. That hasn't been done because looking at the data, eighth graders have dropped three points and uh, fourth graders have dropped one point. So it might not seem like a lot of points, someone said, but it's going in the wrong direction. So let me ask you a question. How many of you ever received a C minus in a class and you were so thrilled to get a C minus because you passed and you were going to get a reward from your parent? <laughs> for getting a C minus. Yay! But you really didn't like the class and you were so glad to get through with it. Okay, I'm seeing some participation there. How many of you ever received a C minus in a class that um, had another level to it? And because you got a C minus, you struggled in those higher levels. And people who had A's and B's just were passing you up. And it was difficult for you to move forward, whether it was a foreign language or math level. Okay, so a C minus is how we see in this nation proficiency. So we're not even at a C minus level as a nation, definitely not in California, which makes me think, so, think about those communities that have um, people who don't, you know, the kids are getting a lot of support and intervention, they're getting those A's and B's, and they aren't even getting to be reflected in our national score because there's so many D's and F's that our students are getting in reading. This is just reading. I'm not even talking about math. So we really have a crisis here. And 
I'm going to pass through this so we save some time because we know one in five people have dyslexia. But let me ask, did, did you know that two thirds of students who fail to reach grade level reading by fourth grade will end up in prison or on welfare? Also, in our general ed classrooms, we have a category called Specific Learning Disability, SLD. And 85% of those students have dyslexia. When I was teaching reading, the intervention reading, and it was at a very low tier, this reading program I have is called a tier three because it's intervention. But I was teaching a tier one intervention and those same students were in my math. They struggled, the dyslexia was seen in my math because they had word problems. They couldn't read and they just hated it. They just didn't have any self-esteem. They had excuses to be sick. They wanted to leave the room and they always act, they often acted out in bad behavior. So getting them to cooperate was another challenge our teachers are faced with. So 85% of those students could be exited out of special ed. So here's your next simulation. Take a look at this second paragraph and I want you to change every T to a D and every E to an I and then rewrite those words. This is an excellent simulation because we don't think about that giving that extra, the child that extra support with highlighters. So if you were to highlight every, have the student highlight every T with pink and every E with blue, and then after they highlight the letters, then they can make the change. You could do one color at a time and then do the second color. But breaking things up into steps and giving them those colors, it's gonna help use multiple modalities. Let me ask you a question. How many of you learn better when you're seeing something? Raise your hands. You have to see colors, you have to see notes, you have to see it on the board. Dyslexic people are very visual. They often work better in, when they see 3D. Okay, how many of you learn better when you're hearing something? Books on tape. Repeat what you said. I don't understand what you, re repetition. Okay, how many of you learn better when you're speaking, talking things out? You know when you have a problem and you're sharing it with your sister and hey, you just answered your own problem. <laughs> so even speaking helps us learn. And then finally, kinesthetic, hands-on. You have to touch it to do it. Man, I couldn't use a ca learn a cash register from watching a PowerPoint. I had to have my hands-on and practice and make those mistakes and learn. So that's using a multi-sensory modality. Sam Orton and Anna Gillingham talked about that, and I'll share that a little bit later, right now. So, Sam Orton and Anna Gillingham were the pioneers who actually spawned the International Dyslexia Association. It didn't start until the 1960s, but Sam Orton, who was a neurologist, and Anna Gillingham was a, psych a psychologist and a teacher, they saw the children struggling back in the, well, Sam Orton was in the 30s and the 40s, and Anna Gillingham, 40s and 50s, and they called it word blindedness. And they realize when the students are using multiple modalities, they're, they're accessing auditory, visual, kinesthetic, and they're speaking that they're gonna learn better. And while this works, it works to the strengths as well as to a student's weakness. And while this helps all students, dyslexic students need this, definitely, definitely. So a reading program also needs to be explicit. You can't just have a student read it and figure it out for themselves. They have to be taught. And Sam Orton and Anna Gillingham introduced the program should be structured, 
systematic and sequential. And this makes sense in our own life. You know, how you change a baby's diaper, how you feed the dog in the morning, how you get dressed in the morning. We have structures and systems in our lives that make sense. And if you go out of order, you could ruin, ruin something. Like when you're making a recipe, if you're making um, a cheese souffle, if you do a couple little things wrong, you'll wreck the cheese souffle. So the systems are in place for a reason. Now, to bring this into a classroom is really hard for teachers. I've been in classrooms where I've just had all this curriculum on my shelf, and I've been told, okay, there it is. Pull something together for your student. Look at their IEP goal. What do they need? And you're like, so having this reading program available at an affordable price where a teacher can learn it in a day is what I want to offer you. I'm not going to sell today, but I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. But you'll have tools and you'll be equipped. Here are some people you may recognize that have been great contributors in this world. I don't have Leonardo da Vinci here. He's one of my favorites because he's an engineer. And he said his best pastime was to have someone read to him. I don't know if you knew this about him, but he used to actually write script backwards. And he'd have to look in a mirror to see what he wrote. So here I like to put the brain, the job of the brain, because I want you to see that the left side addresses language. I used to tell students when they're learning phonics, it's like a file cabinet on the left side of the brain and every drawer was a new sound. And if students weren't learning how to say sounds together, then like, the, like ELD, ILD, if they didn't learn word families, uh, the, the right drawer wasn't going to be open for that sound and they just continued to struggle. On the right is where music is very pr predominant. And as we input information into our ears, it actually crosses to the opposite side. But if it's intended, music will cross right back and language will cross right back. So that's how that works. It comes in and crosses and it goes where it's intended to be. So myth or fact? 80% of juveniles in the juvenile court system have dyslexia. Show me a raise of hands if you think that's true. And you are correct, it is true. And this is a story about uh, my police friend or my uh, professor friend who talked about how they determined to build prisons. So now here's your third dyslexia simulation. I want you to read this paragraph and let me know what you feel about it. I'm gonna ask, give you some choices of how you could feel about it. Okay, so now I want you to look at, well, if you think this is just a lot of ideas thrown out there, raise your hand. If you see a lot of potential in this student, raise your hand. Okay, what if you, do, do any of you think this is poetry? Like Picasso, <laughs> we would paint poetry in an odd way. That's what I was thinking. This is probably some kind of modern poetry. Well, now I want you to reread the paragraph, but I'm going to give you the topic sentence. This is how you make a kite. Okay? This is how you make a kite. Now read it again. And it takes on a whole new perspective.
okay? If it breaks loose, however, you will not get a second chance. I think that's really funny. But this story is a real perfect example of a, if a student leaves the classroom, misses some direction and comes back, that student has a real hard time jumping in and uh, picking up where he or she left off. And we have peers that help each other. So dyslexic children are shy and they may not ask up here for some help. A student without dyslexia wouldn't have any problem to ask, where are we, what did I miss? But dyslexic children are shy. Their self-esteem is typically very low, especially for second and third grade. This is also another great example of why it's important to write things on the board, write instructions on the board, because when the student goes out, out to the bathroom and comes back, they'll know to read the direction on the board, okay? You can draw a picture on the board. If you were to even draw the picture of a kite, you know, this is a kite. It would just give a whole new meaning to the paragraph. This is just some of the data, because some people want to see data. This is in Texas, 15, yeah, 15 years ago, they were working with dyslexic children in Texas. But it shows 80% of the inmates were functionally illiterate. And the, the main cause for illiteracy is dyslexia. We just have not been addressing it. We've been afraid to say it. And when I had my private practice, I actually had a magnetic piece on the side of my car that said, dyslexia is not a four letter word. And that might take you a little bit <laughs> to understand that. But we were afraid to say it. And some schools are still afraid to say it. Myth or fact, dyslexia has been known to cause ulcers in children. Good, you guys are raising your hands. Yep, the dyslexic children experience anxiety, depression, and I even had a parent say that her, her son had dyslexia-induced ulcer. And I had another parent who said her 10-year-old confessed to her that when he was eight, he would always go to the bathroom to avoid reading. And his mom thought he had a bladder infection and they spent so many weekends in the doctor's office finding out why he kept having to go to the bathroom. And he confessed to her, I didn't want to read. Success, the S stands for success. What does success look like in your home? I have a question for you. How many of you remember you going to the library or taking your own kids to the library or even grandkids and they love to look at all the books and they would spend hours and bring the books home only to go back a week later and get more books? Fun, fun times. Yep, sharing reading, reading to you, reading to siblings. Well, that's not a reality in the home of a dyslexic child because the children do suffer with such anxiety. When they're in the classroom, they will glance and guess at words. And like I showed with the writing, they're going to not recognize. Um, unless it's memorized, they're not going to know the word. And interestingly enough, dyslexic children can't memorize the days of the week or the months of the year. It's very hard for them. I had a dyslexic par parent who was also a teacher tell me she doesn't even know the alphabet unless she sings it. She said, I can't tell you where the R is or where the T is or where the, where the F is. She goes, I have to sing the alphabet to remember where they are in, the, in it. So I know if you're not familiar with seeing an alphabet strip, you might not know that easily either. And I remember when I was first starting to teach reading, I'd have to sing it myself. But, you know, after being 30 years old, it just, it's a testimony that reading is very hard for the children. This is Dr. Sperry. He was a neuroscientist back in the 1960s who was popular for his split brain theory. What he did was work with seizure patients. He severed the central part of their brain called the corpus callosum. It's really clearly seen here. And he worked with the left and the right sides of the brain separately. 
And imagine a student, and he found out by separating the brain, the, the corpus callosum, the left and the right sides of the brain could work together in concert or they could work independently and the seizure stopped. So he won a Nobel Prize for this in the 1980s. 20 years later, he got a Nobel Prize for his split brain theory. So imagine a dyslexic child reads from the wrong side of the brain. Imagine they read from the right angular gyrus. What's happening is when they're reading it's the right angular gyrus wants to send over the wrong word. It'll send farm instead of from. It'll send talp instead of clap. So it'll send the letters in the wrong order. It'll even send the wrong word. It'll send was instead of saw or, or spot instead of stop. Wouldn't that be scary? A kid couldn't read a stop sign. So what we do with the music, we play it in the left ear and it crosses over to the right angular gyrus and it gives it a job it likes to do. So it doesn't take over the reading. And then we have the spelling exercises in the right ear and they cross over to the left angular gyrus where the language is and it gives it a job it likes to do like Pilates of the brain. And by bypass, by doing that dichotically, it's called the dichotic method of learning two inputs at one time, you're bypassing the corpus callosum, which we call the lazy referee. So the auditory processing is gonna be faster. So I was really excited because um, Dr. Roger Spear used to say in his conferences that if educators would take this knowledge into the classroom, we'd have some breakthrough with these kids who had word blindedness. So people were trying to help dyslexic children back in the 1960s. Uh, the man who worked with him was Dr. Gazignega. Okay, slide, I want you to go forward. So it starts in preschool with rhyming. How many of you know what age a student starts rhyming? Raise your hand if you know. They should start rhyming at age three and four. If kids aren't able to rhyme at that age, it could be a red flag. But a lot of students need parents to work with them and talk to them and teach them about rhymes. So it starts. There's a connection between sound and the written word. This is a graph that showed my doctoral research. Students entered my reading program in the 10 to 20 percentile range. After 12 weeks, those who used only the reading program reached the 40 percentile range. Those who used music achieved the 60 percentile range. So this was a significant improvement just using a structured systematic reading program that I used. This was an additional significant improvement because of the music. It will make a difference. So this, when, you, when kids are listening to music, it's also going to help them if they have ADD, ADHD, because it keeps that wandering attention from wandering. Even when I taught math, I let the student listen to, listen to music in the left ear. A little bit more research by Adam Kroon, addressing explicit reading instruction. I'll let you read this. There's a cognitive advantage when using music. Accelerates their success. People are writing about this, but no one's using it in the classroom. This was my data when I had my private practice. I worked with students from second to 10th grade. And these were the percent increases from comprehension once students learn vocabulary, develop their vocabulary, they start learning the grammar and phonics rules, their comprehension is just going to jump. That's why second grade Cruz was able to read at a fourth grade level because his comprehension just jumped. He understood the grammar rules. So this is my book, A Message of Hope. 
how music enhances reading for dyslexic children. This should be in the hand of every teacher, every parent of a dyslexic child, and every professor who teaches um, an education course and, and with their students because it shows what dyslexia looks like, it shows um, how to recognize it in the classroom. And I remember 10 years of teaching, I would always get how classroom management books, second language learner books. Well, how about a book about dyslexia? Let's get rid of this reading crisis in our nation. Let's all work together. Dyslexic children often have negative self-talk. I'm dumb. I don't want to try. Teachers will tell them they're lazy. And Actually, they're, very, they're twice gifted. When we are training children to retrain their brain, we're not getting rid of their giftedness, their mechanical engineering gifts. And dyslexia causes the classroom to be a very difficult place for the dyslexic child. So here's another uh, question, myth or fact. Raise your hand if you think it's true. You're right, no one's raising their hand. Only a small percentage of teachers are being trained. The last district I was in, only the chairs of the reading program were sent to the training. And here I was the dyslexia specialist. So schools have confusion. They want the, the psychologist to be in charge or they want the speech pathologist. And those guys have full plates. Let's just teach the teachers. You know, one teacher can be trained to work with five students and then be put in a class of 20. And then one next year, be in a class of 140 students because in our education system, teachers are rotated around and they're not always promised these small classes of 20 students. But what you learn for five students is gonna equip you to help all those children. So you're gonna change thousands of lives. And I think this is interesting. Someone didn't realize by the time the child's in fourth grade, those teachers expect them to read. They're not reading teachers. They want to start teaching those kids how to do research and write. And uh, so we need to teach these children how to read in first through third grade. Here are some unfamiliar sentences I have my students write when I assess them. This is where they omit the letters, Miss omit punctuation. These are the sentences we read earlier for the sixth grader who wrote them. These are nonsense words that I have students try to read. Younger students um, are, we try these ones, older students will try these. I'll just read some of these for you. Bees, said, zam, bake, lep, suit, pluck, kelp. Just an example of knowing where the letters are and recognizing the position and the sound for the letter. Another myth or fact. Yep, hands are shooting up. It is so true, 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 true. Using an Orton-Gillingham method with music and the step-by-step -step reading program follows that, students are making one to three year gains in only six weeks in reading vocabulary, fluency, and or comprehension. One of the things I'm doing is starting to do some tutoring online and I'm tutoring for tutoring children for summer school and doing my training online. So you have to let me know if you're interested in that. I'm also going to be a life. I am a lifelong learner, and I'm receiving a five thousand dollar grant to get the official certification for Orton Gillingham, which is going to enhance my program even better. So the learning outcomes we covered today: Are you able to describe dyslexia to others? Show me your hand. Do you think you could describe dyslexia? to your um, principal or assistant principal who didn't know what it was. Can you explain to someone what it feels like to be dyslexic? 
how that child struggles, raise your hand if you, if you have empathy now, more empathy for what that child goes through and a real desire to help them now. And then are you able to recognize it in a classroom? If you're a tutor, if you're an instructional aide, or you're at a learning center, will you be able to recognize this and be able to nip it in the bud, address it right away? Don't push it aside. They don't just need more time on tests. They don't need help from a peer. They need explicit teaching and instruction. Okay. So tomorrow, I'm proud of you guys for staying with me this long. Tomorrow's learning outcomes, you'll understand the ways to teach phonological awareness, and you're going to learn about the Orton Gillingham model. Um, how it, I'm going to demonstrate what those steps are and whether you do them your own way and you incorporate them with tools you have at home or you'd be interested in getting additional training from me, I will tell you how that's going to be available tomorrow. So you guys get five points, five stars. If you have your pencil and you want to write the code for tomorrow's webinar, I put it there. I don't know how many use the link or the code, but I know people use both. And then I have a podcast that you can listen to some of my interviews with parents and teachers. I have some really interesting, and a dyslexic student. So back in 2015, when the assembly bill was signed, you know, the, the harvest was growing. Now it's time, we, you know, the harvest time is now. We built the app. So we built the app, we built the reading program. We wanna see us all come together. I love this field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. So we built it. And I'm gonna stop my sharing. And we have about eight minutes for questions. I'm so glad you guys are here. People from Ireland and Africa, welcome. So do you have any questions? Go ahead and write in the chat. Be sure you put all panelists and attendees. Any questions here? One of the questions people ask me is, how do you implement this in a, in a school? Well, what we're finding is implementing it in an after-school program doesn't conflict with the unions. And we can pay the tutors a little bit less. When I write my grants, I'm only paying, them, paying the tutors 15 bucks an hour. Teachers are gonna need 40, you know, 50, $60 per hour. So another way to implement it is if you could talk to your administration, get, allow the teachers to pull the kids out for an hour. It takes one hour a day, four to five days a week. And they're gonna make fast progress. So that's a way, and then also we're working in a learning center where the students who are already there at an art center, they're there for art, and they're gonna be there for the after school intervention. So that's three ways we've tried it. So the music that I use is classical, and I just picked uh, Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, I just gave my engineer all these tracks of classical music. So you can get earbuds that play, it's like a stereo. You just put them in the left ear and the right ear and the music plays in the left ear and the spelling exercise play in the right ear. Now the app, Dunking Dyslexia, is intended to be used with the reading program. It's step nine of nine steps. However, if children want to help their spelling and their reading and they're already understanding phonics, they can use the app. And it's only $9.99 a month. It's on Android and, and uh, Apple. And they can raise a C to a B or a B to an A. Also, um, looking forward, okay, good. I'm looking forward to sharing more tomorrow. Someone asked, um, in the past, can you use other music? Well, when I taught middle school and high school, the students had their own playlists and we always want to empower them and you know pick our battles. 
So we wouldn't ask them to play classical music if they're in the classroom. If they want to listen to their earbud quietly as they worked, and the minute they start looking at their phones and rocking out or singing, they lose the privilege. But it's a great opportunity to let them listen to music in the left ear. Um, I may have had one or two cases where the student said, I prefer it in my right ear. So I said, okay. So, you know, every bra the brains are different, but this is the research behind when kids are reading from the wrong side of their brain. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so the app is called Dis Dunking Dyslexia. If, I'm not sure what that means. If, if children are um, much, okay. So if you're, if you're putting a question, put it to um, everybody if you can, all panelists and attendees. One of the questions is, um, how would you interact with children who are much further in their education and they're extremely reluctant to read? Well, I think children need to be reading stories that they're excited about. So it depends on what, I, what I've taught in other webinars is how to share reading. You read a little bit, they read a little bit. You read a little bit, they read a little bit. Do some share reading, it depends how young they are. And take turns, take turns reading with them. I don't, uh, APD, I'm not sure what you're asking. Does music work for students that not only, so um, I know children who have had autism also can have dyslexia and ADD, ADHD. The music helps, it can hurt, but trying it. Oh, auditory processing. All dyslexic children have auditory processing disorder. That's, it, they have it. So when your child is diagnosed with auditory processing disorder, that's dyslexia. They just don't want to say it. They don't want to say it. See how the child's re writing and reading is. So auditory processing, how I explain that, um, a teacher will ask, the teacher will, uh, you know, read a story or tell a story. And then the teacher will ask some questions. And students are raising their hands answering those questions. So then the teacher reads another story. And the teacher will ask some more questions. And the dyslexic child, well, so kids are raising their hand and the dyslexic child raises his or her hand. And the teacher is so happy that the dyslexic child raises their hand. So she calls on the child and the child answers a question to the first story. So that's that processing just delayed. They finally know the answer, but it's really taken them long. So all the students laugh and they mock the student. So it kills their self-esteem. Another auditory processing uh, example is if they won't, students won't understand the homophones used in certain contexts. And I remember working with a, a person who didn't understand um, this is due tomorrow. This person thought the administrator was saying, do it tomorrow. So she got in trouble because I had it done by tomorrow. It was due tomorrow. And so some people just have that auditory processing disorder. They're not understanding it in context, which is why teaching grammar rules and phonics really, really helps. So the training is very affordable. I will talk, I'm gonna give you a special price for it tomorrow when I talk about it because of our COVID isolation. Even though we're starting to come out of our homes, I still wanna give you guys a special price. I have a training scheduled on the 18th, but I'll um, tell you about that tomorrow. I have a landing page on my website if you wanna look into that today, or you could email me. But it's very affordable and I train you in one day. Okay, so that ends our hour. I'm so glad that you were with me today and I'm gonna stop the recording and I just wanna thank you. Hope you have a blessed day and I hope to see you tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marianne Cintron with Step-by-Step -Step Dyslexia Solutions. Every child has a right to read.